I'm Erin Runyon, and you're watching Facets Television. I'm Kevin McDonald, and you're watching Facets Television. Tonight we have a very special show. In studio with us is Erin Runyon, and Erin is the mom of a young girl by the name of Samantha Runyon. Samantha was murdered on July 15, 2002, and was found the following day. Her murderer is now sitting in San Quentin prison and is subject to the death penalty. And today we're going to talk not about Samantha's death, but what her mom has done as a result of it. Thank you so much for coming in. Oh, thank Aaron. you for having me. I really appreciate it. So, I mean, for those that, that don't understand what it's like, I mean, you lost your little girl. You've managed to do some amazing things with it. So what is it that makes it makes you drive and get up every morning? I mean, hmm. you lost your little girl. How do you do that? I do that because I have to do that. Um, Samantha was my absolute joy. And when it, it came to a point after she was taken, and she was only five years old, um, that I was looking at her pictures and I would cry. You know, every, every time I thought of her, I cried. And um, I got to a point where I, I just resented it. It just didn't seem right that I should cry every time I look at this little girl who had her entire life done nothing but bring me joy and yeah. laughter. And so um, for me, I have to give it purpose. I have to make sense of what happened to Samantha. And the only way I can do that is by making effective change and working to combat crimes against children. Well, I have to tell you, I mean, as you know, I'm involved in a lot of stuff in, in the crime yes. prevention world. And every time I see you, you're, you're your, your, your energy and your ability to just push forward and push through what is traumatic for so many people absolutely amazes me. So um, let's get a little into a little bit about um, the Joyful Child Foundation. So what a great name, considering you said that she brought joy to you. And yes. I'd like you to be able to tell the folks watching, what are you doing now so that this doesn't happen to other children? Well, you know, when I started The Joyful Child, I had no idea that it was going to be so helpful to me personally in coping with Samantha's death, but it absolutely has given me a way to bring Samantha into my everyday mm -hmm. and in a very positive, proactive way. Um, and I remember early on I had a, I went to a conference, a law enforcement conference, and mm -hmm. they co talked about the crime triangle, and it's a very common yep. little um, theory in, in law enforcement, and that is in order for a crime to take place, there has to be an opportunity, a victim, and an offender. Mm -hmm. And if you take any one of those three things away, the crime does not happen. Right. And that kind of became the basis for our approach at the Joyful Child Foundation. So we combat the opportunity for crimes to take place by raising awareness amongst parents. We do child protection education for adults mm -hmm. um, about recognizing predatory behaviors and risk reduction tips and strategies for parents, how to talk with your children and teach them without scaring them. Um, and then for children, we eliminate the victim by teaching them about personal safety empowerment. So right. we teach them what to look for, how to recognize potential danger, and physical skills to resist and escape, to stun and run. So let's back up on that. I'm <laughs> gonna, I definitely want to get more into the children's thing, but yeah. I do want to back up. because It's so important that people understand of course it's nobody's fault if something happens to, to a child. We, right. we can't go there. But there are definitely ways and things that you can do yes. to help raise the odds that your child isn't going to be a victim. So right. I, I'm fascinated by the fact that you originally chose to bring the education to the adults. Yes. Um, because I know especially people that are more trusting, right? Mm -hmm. um, the world is not the nicest place. And if you don't give parents the power, especially in the case of the internet and some of the the luring behaviors and things that are happening where you as a parent may not even know it's happening. How right. do you recognize those things? Right. So now let's move to Rad Kids. And I'd like to hear more about what really is Rad Kids and how does that help children to defend themselves? Well, Rad Kids is a five-day personal empowerment safety education program. And um, I became a certified instructor in 2008. And then as a consultant to the Orange County Department of Education, we actually conducted Rad Kids um, trainings uh, throughout the county as an after-school program. And um, it is an awesome program. And what it taught me was how to teach children without just telling them about being safe. Mm 
Right. And so it's very interactive. Everything we talk about in terms of safety, we get up and do. And I actually took all of the lessons that I learned in teaching rad kids and spent the last year developing a, the Joyful Child Foundation's Brave programs. Mm -hmm. And so now, in addition to rad kids, we are doing our own 90-minute workshops for children, pre-K all the way up to 12th grade. And um, we also developed a curriculum that we piloted throughout the county this year. So That's um, it's very exciting. Yeah. My goal is really to find a way to bring safety education to every single child in America. That's my goal. So let's go back to why this is so important because I, I mm, in the case okay. of your daughter, Samantha, yeah. um, she's on your front porch effectively. She's got a little friend next to her. Um, the classic that no one believe ever happens, man comes up and says, I can't find my dog. Can you please help me? Mm -hmm. She does what little girls do. Well, of course I want to help find the puppy. Mm -hmm. So is Rad Kids designed to help children understand that's not wrong, that's not okay, and is that kind of what it's about? It is part of what it's about, absolutely. Okay. Abduction um, prevention is absolutely a huge part of what the Brave programs are about as well as Rad Kids. And the... Um, well, the way we teach that is actually there's a role play activity in which we go through tricks mm -hmm. and we talk about how adults that you don't know should not be asking you for help for, uh, for anything. Right. Adults right. that you don't know ask other adults for help. Mm -hmm. It's not normal for them to ask a child for help, not for a lost puppy, not for directions, not to offer you money and a job. Yep. They should be talking to your adult. Exactly. And if they do, that's that's the red flag to run, that 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 is your indication that there's no conversation to be had. You run, yell, I'll get my adult to talk to you or my, my daddy to mm -hmm. talk to you, even if you don't have one, I don't care. <laughs> um, I like yell, that you're saying you're run and you're not them. just saying it's not okay. You're actually saying this run. should be a trigger to run immediately. Absolutely. Right? And that is literally what we practice with the children. So they hear at least 20 different tricks in the course of that activity and they hear it and they run hear it and they run and every time they run they all get my adult to help you yeah that's fantastic um, well first we talk about who safe adults are so that they recognize if somebody is not being a safe adult um, we talk about what they can do in those situations when they are in danger and they come up with their own brave plan their action plan for what they will do and what's really important is that parents not wait until there's a dangerous situation to teach their children teach them now when we have the opportunity to use real life experiences when you go to the store what do you do if you get lost where would where would we meet how would I find you come up with your plan with your child so that you know what they'll do in that emergency situation and your child has the opportunity to practice and with me is Gina Ramirez Gina is the ambassador for Joyful Child Foundation but she's also an Orange County probation officer and a supervisor in the sex crimes and sex offenders unit thank you so much for talking with us thank you so can you tell me a little bit about um, what got you involved with Joyful Child Foundation? Uh, I was really impressed with Erin and what she was trying to do and I really felt that this is where we needed to be educating the public about child safety and educating parents about keeping their children safe in the community. So how does your work in the probation department um, enhance your ability to work with kids training them like here? Well, it gives me a background and experience having worked with um, probationers and those convicted of um, sexual offenses. It gives me kind of an insight as to how we want to keep our kids safe and, and uh, educate our kids on, on recognizing unsafe behavior. So for the parents that are out there wondering, is this something I would want my child to be involved in, you know, what are a couple of things that you can tell them that, that might motivate them to get their kids involved or get their school to sign up? It's definitely worthwhile. It won't cost you anything. The lessons learned are invaluable. Uh, keeping your children safe and teaching them to recognize behaviors that are uncomfortable for them. Teaching parents to accept those statements from their children when they say they're uncomfortable. And just calling out those, those unsafe behaviors I think really limits that offender's um, ability to take advantage of that family and that child. So for those that may not see the program, maybe one or two tips that they can take away from just seeing you on TV today. Believe your children when they tell you something's not right and doesn't feel good, and just always be aware. Be aware of your child, be aware of who's around them and who has contact with them. Thank you so much for talking with us today. I'm Kevin McDonald, and with me was Gina Ramirez with the Joyful Child Foundation and Orange County Probation. Thank you. There's pain there, but you manage to always keep a smile on your face, and yeah. I think that that helps everybody around you because we're trying to move forward with a dark subject. And, right. And, and I, having known you since, actually, I think um, we met the day that it occurred at the Stanton Sheriff Station. So this is why this case means so much to me. Not that it doesn't mean a lot to everybody that hears about it, right. but um, to see you've done so much 
and, you know, since Thank that happened you. to me. It's just, it's amazing. Thank you. I have to say, there was, you asked me about the, the challenges in, in doing this work. Yeah, please. And there are, indeed, a lot of pushback um, questions from parents and teachers when it comes to teaching children defense skills. Yeah. Um, and I, I just wanted to speak to that a little bit because the National Center for Missing Exploited Children did a study of 500 attempted abductions mm -hmm. um, you know, that were not successful. Right. And in those 500 cases, they found that in 85% of those cases, it was the child's physical resistance that enabled the child to escape. Wow. Only 11% of the time did an adult intervene. And that's what parents have to realize. That's huge. We cannot be with children 24-7, as much as we want to be. Yep. When they are in danger, it is when they are alone and they are the only ones in a position to protect themselves. I couldn't agree more, and I think that something that's really important, and this is something I've been pushing for years, yeah. and that is that we, we ingrain in our children that you respect adults. It's so true. I ingrain in my children, no you don't, you respect adults that earn respect. And <laughs> if you don't know them, you, you don't want to be rude or, or obnoxious just to do it. Right. But you don't owe anything to anyone. Right. Whether, because they're an adult, and in fact, the trust level goes down, in my opinion, the older <laughs> they get. So my daughters, all they knew it from the first day that daddy gave them permission to go, I don't care who you are, I'm leaving now, right? right. You know, um, or whatever. So I think that's an important part of what's training is required is to teach children just because that's an adult telling you to do something does not make what they're telling you to do okay. Absolutely. And in fact, they need to be empowered to say no and leave or do whatever they have to to, to resist. And, and I think that's a big challenge. Yeah, we, I really focused on that kind of empowerment in the BRAVE programs because I really wanted to give children some words, some verbiage to use when they find them in an uncomfortable situation and really emphasize that it doesn't matter if it's a five-year-old or a 90-year-old. Yeah. If somebody is making you uncomfortable, if you have that feeling that this is, does not feel right, that you have a right to get away. Trust your gut, yes, yep. absolutely. And so giving them words to be able to do that and, and actual practice is part of what we what we do to empower the children. So let me ask you, where, where do you see the program going for you? I mean, I know that we all have dreams and visions. If you were, you know, queen for a day and ran the world, mm -hmm. well, you know, where would you be in five years? In five years? Yeah. I hope that we will have the BRAVE programs throughout the state of California and very possibly beyond that. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the K-12 curriculum, I think, is really, it's comprehensive. It fits in as a supplemental PE and health curriculum. And um, we've had great success in the pilot phase. The, the teachers have really enjoyed it. I made it very teacher-friendly. There are mm -hmm. lesson plans that, you know, teachers can just take and, and do in 15-minute increments throughout the school day mm -hmm. and throughout the school year. And um, it's gotten great rave review, rave reviews so far. So. No, that's terrific. Yeah. So have you, have you, are you doing public-private? Um, yes. How, how does the program work as far as getting it started and funded? Well, um, we are launching it publicly, the training and everything, come October. Okay. And um, so I'm, we'll see how that all goes from there. Um, but the training itself is just a half-day in-service teacher training for the curriculum. Okay. For the workshops, it's a half-day training that we usually do on Saturdays or in evenings because okay. the workshops are really designed for law enforcement agencies and community partner agencies that serve children. Right. So if you know, you, you're an agency that works with children and want to be able to offer a r workshop on personal safety, we can give you that tool to do. And does that funding have to be done or assigned by a particular location by city, or how does, the, how does it work? Because I know with some of the programs I've worked in, you've had to get a grant for a particular school district yes, or whatever. Right. So how does it work with your program? For, for those that are watching, pay attention. <laughs> well, the programs are going to be fee-based, so the training is fee-based. Okay. We are soliciting grants to sponsor the training for our community partner agencies okay. and for school districts that are Very serving high-need communities. Yes. Great, great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so to those in the legislature, <laughs> this is a program we need to get, you know, expanded, and Absolutely. this is the woman that can make it happen. Um, Thank you. So let me get into a little bit of, of, you know, how have you managed to maintain in, in your family, and how did this affect your kind of your life dy dynamic beyond yourself, oh. if I may ask? <laughs> um, wow. Well, my husband co-founded the Joyful Child Foundation with me and thank goodness has been a rock for throughout the last 13 years, um, but especially the last 10. Mm -hmm. um, so he is the treasurer of, of the foundation, and okay. we have a, a full board of directors, um, and he has, he, he's really very, very supportive. You know, I fly all over the place 
doing speaking engagements, and he's Mr. Dad. You're one of the busiest people I've ever <laughs> seen. So I can imagine that's great to have him being able, you yes. know, uh, supporting you in that process. Yes, and for my children, it's been it's been interesting. I, I don't know how else to put it, really. For yeah. them, I really work hard to protect their anonymity yeah. um, because I didn't want them to feel like ever they were growing up in Samantha's shadow. Um, so I, don't I think really you've done a great job of that. No, I th I, yeah. and I've seen it. I think you've done a great job of that because I've never seen any reference. Yeah. to them and you know unlike some other cases where you know it, they seem to get dragged in as part of the story and that, I, I, right. I can very much respect that you don't want them to be part of that story but they are awesome and they yeah. bring me so much joy and definitely help keep me grounded you know yeah well we all need grounding you know, that <laughs> we have pie in the sky ideas and dreams about what we want to yes. do and so on and so forth um, in the public sector what has been your biggest challenge if I may ask is it is it mm. the government regulations is it is it um, <gasps> skepticism I mean because because I like to, to give other charities and other folks that are on a mission an understanding of how you've overcome because it takes I, I'm in the, involved in it a lot so right. you know what have you been your biggest challenges and how have you overcome them within dealing with the government and law enforcement and so on well I think lobbying for the Adam Walsh Child Protection Act was my first kind of foyer into um, lobbying and advocacy. And, um, and Adam Walsh, for those, is John Walsh's son. Yes. Okay, yeah. so I just want to make sure we're... And, and it was the most comprehensive child safety bill um, this country has ever seen. And I lobbied very hard for it. And in the process, um, as I was going through D.C., would literally bump into other surviving parents yes. um, in the halls lobbying for that. So we ultimately decided um, after it passed, we were invited to the Rose Garden and we were there when it was signed and um, did all of our photo opportunities with politicians right. and then learned that it had been authorized but not, but not appropriated. That's right, not funded. <laughs> been there many times. Right? Yep. So that was my first lesson in, in legislative advocacy was so, the realization. So for those, so for those that, that are not clear on what happened is that you can pass a law that says, here's what's going to happen and here's the law. But until appropriation says, yes, we're going to pay for it, the law doesn't exist. Right. So we then have to go back and lobby for a whole other six months, nine months, possibly a year to get it funded. Yeah. Um, and so that was a little frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> now, was it fully funded, partially funding, funded? How did that ultimately end? Ultimately, it was almost entirely funded, almost okay. entirely, the, the, yes. Um, unfortunately, it has only been partially implemented, and less and less so. The, the, um, the government has um, relaxed a lot of the provisions significantly. Um, there's been a lot of uh, backlash a around some of the sex offender registration. SORNA was part of um, that which is the Sex Offender Registration Notification Act. Right. And so that created the National Sex Offender Registry. And um, the idea of that, the reason we wanted that, is currently there are about 750,000 registered sex offenders around the country, and we've lost track of about 100,000 of them. And part of the reason we lose track of them is offenders change where they live, yep. right? Yep. And so they move to a no new state, and the other state doesn't notice for six months, a year and a half, that several years missing. that they're missing. Right. And so we lose that trail. And so the idea of SORNA was to create a, a single way that all every nation was classifying the offenders mm -hmm. so that they could all be on one database and it would be easy when they moved from one place to the other for law enforcement ag agencies to communicate and to follow up on their Yeah, and now you get into the difference between a liberal state and a more conservative state and one, yes. you know. Yes. I know the notification issue here in California and actually even the residential restrictions has actually caused some challenges too because now what's what I'm hearing is they're just going homeless. Right. So now they don't have an address to register to anymore. Right. So, th so there's and then this we lose big track circle. of them completely. Right. So now, I mean, where you think you're starting to win, you end up going backwards. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. California actually decided not even to try and comply with SORNA. They they waived their right to the money that the federal government was offering for mm -hmm. compliance or efforts to comply, and they mm -hmm. just decided not to because part of the provision was juvenile offenders um, who were con convicted of, of serious sex offenses, and California will not put them on the registry. Yeah, and I, I think that's unfortunate because, um, you know, based on the files that I've read over the years and the cases I've been intimately aware of and involved in, you know, through crime victim support and stuff like that, there are a lot of young adults 
offending against other young people. And so it's kind of sad that, you know, you can have a neighborhood with icons mm -hmm. showing you who the sex offenders are, and there could be four in between that just happen to be under 18 years old. Right. So, well, and I, I actually do a whole presentation on how to understand what Megan's Law means because people really do not understand that almost half of registered sex offenders don't show up on one of those dots. They're only on the lists by county or zip code. Right. And so, again, in between, there might be somebody who's on that register but they're not going to show up if you do a two-mile search around your house. Yep. Yeah, and that's, well, that's one of the complications <gasps> of uh, how do you find out. And, and then the, the ranking system is another thing. I mean, yes. you know, what does the certain, the different levels of, of quote, risk. a predator or risk, ma does it, what does it really mean? Yeah. Um, Great, we started our assessment. Yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I should. <laughs> I mean, because I, I, I'm starting to think that, they're, that the folks that can make these changes are folks like you, honestly who have the credibility yeah. to walk into a room and go, I'm not just some person off the street. Right. I lost my little girl, and I'm here because I truly don't want to see this ever happen again. Yeah. So and maybe, I've lived and breathed you know, this cause for 10 years. I yeah, know a lot about day, it. Every day, 24 hours a day, and even when you're asleep, I'm sure your subconscious is dealing with the yeah. issues as well. So, yeah. And risk um, assessment, just so you know, is a joke. It really yeah. is a joke. The, the law enforcement has to have some way of categorizing risk in order to justify releasing these people back to the public. That is what risk assessment is about. It is a made-up justification for releasing yep. people back to the public. I would agree. I would agree. And, and then we have AB 109, which is using that risk assessment. Um, for those that don't understand what AB 109 was, it was a realignment of moving state prisoners into county jails because of budgets. And so as a result, we now have a county doing everything they can to make it look like they're releasing non-high-risk offenders when they really aren't. Yes. No, uh, what, what has happened is what AB 109 did and what we're actually, I'm, I am involved in trying to reverse this because mm -hmm. the reclassification of sex offenders and violent offenders to non-sex, non-violent offenders yeah. is absolutely it's horrifying. It's insane. It's so dangerous. Yeah, it's insane. And people have already been killed and raped as a result of it. Yep. Um, we have a huge, like 58% increase in the number of sex offenders who are cutting off their GPS tracking devices because counties are strapped. They There's don't no have the resources them. to yeah. go fa find yeah. these guys. And then when they do arrest them on a simple parole or probation violation, they the judges don't even put them back in jail because yeah. they're full. Yeah, and this is one thing I think where this state has failed miserably. We, we have classified drug offenders as the equivalent of a rapist murderer right. classic what you know whatever the the ridiculousness is on this violent side of the world right. and as a result of m mandatory minimums in the drug world they're taking up space in our state prisons where we could have right. people who did stuff like what happened to your daughter or even those that are right on the release plan, right. right, is what I like to call them, which is really sad and pathetic. So <laughs> for those that are, are not aware, if mm -hmm. we don't pay more for prisons, the federal government has ordered thousands of prisoners to be released. Right. And they are being released that, right now. That is where AB 109 came from. Yeah, and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Mm -hmm. They're being released. They are being released. So. And unfortunately, part of the way that they are being released is they are being released based upon their last conviction. So if you have a sex offender who has committed multiple sex offenses, and their last violation of their parole was um, petty theft. Petty theft. Yep. They are getting reclassified as a non-sex offender and put you know, onto county probation instead of back onto state parole. So we have a person with four violent felonies, and they get busted on a petty. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter who they really are; it's who the state or the county wants to make them up to be, so that they don't have to pay. Mm -hmm. They keep them in jail. This is who's running our system right now. So. And as soon as that law took effect, you had you had parolees who were literally trying to get their parole agents to rebook them so that they could get reclassified and have a shorter term of supervision. You know, that's an interesting thought. I could just horrifying. see them going in and getting arrested for stealing a pack oh, of gum so that they could get... Yes, they were they were openly amazing. opening alcohol in front of the parole offices, like Maybe. trying to get rearrested. Well, <laughs> I, I can't, I mean, I can't tell you how frustrating it is, but how exciting at the same time to know that there's folks like you that are going to spend your lives fighting for the rest of us. So... Um, I want to thank you for coming in today. It's been a true honor, oh, and I, I can't say enough. I'd like you to have the opportunity to deliver a message, if you'd like, to the yeah. audience on w what they can do to protect their kids. Well, I think I'd like to send the audience to the Joyful Child Foundation. Um, it's www.thejoyfulchild.org, and you can look at the Be Brave, Be Safe uh, Parents' Guide to Prevention. There are great tips on talking with your children without scaring them. There's a, a uh, 
bookmark on safety tips for talking with your children and check out our programs and see if you want a workshop or have a parent meeting out in your community because you do not keep your children safer by burying your head in the sand. The only way to prevent these crimes is to create the knowledge and the awareness and then to build your skills around recognizing predatory behavior so that you can better protect your children. And I guess in closing I'd want to say that Samantha's motto was be brave and our goal is never to scare children, but to empower them to be brave and to empower you as parents to be brave advocates for your children. Amen. And with that, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. You've been watching Facet, and I'm Kevin McDonald. Done. I'm yeah, sorry. Wow. I kept it to the last minute. Damn. I'm sorry. I was really long. No, you were fine. God. Thank you.